Spider-Man 3, baby. Everyone loved this movie, and IGN ranked it as the number one greatest Spider-Man movie of all time. Uh, hang on. IGN! Alright, so Spider-Man 3 was divisive. 2 is easily one of the best superhero movies ever made, but 3 was filled with needless retcons and plot threads that didn't really mesh well together. But despite that, 15 years later and Spider-Man 3 is mostly seen as a stupid, fun movie. It's goofy, it's dumb, but it's got a lot of charm. And you know, I was always curious about this game. Spider-Man 2 wasn't only a revolution for film, but it posed a radical shift for not only superhero games, but open worlds. In previous releases, and his appearance in Avengers a few months ago, webs magically attached to the ceiling, and while it was functional in indoor environments, it felt incredibly weird outside and made Spider-Man's signature ability pretty lame. But in came Jamie Fristrom. During development of the first game, he was greatly dissatisfied with swinging, and worked on a prototype where webs actually connect to buildings and allow you to swing with real-time physics. It was good stuff, but way too late to make it into the final product, and so, this became the basis of Spider-Man 2. It naturally took a lot of inspiration from GTA 3, but it paved the way for open worlds to be playgrounds for powers and focus on different methods of traversal. Without Spider-Man 2, we may not have games like Gravity Rush, and I don't want to think about a world without Gravity Rush. Simply put, everything before this is what you'd expect from a comic book game, but Spider-Man 2 was an important highlight of the entire console generation. It may not be a masterpiece in combat and mission structure, but it absolutely is a masterpiece in movement. Despite loving Spidey 2 as a kid, I just didn't play Spider-Man 3. I remember it being a pretty big deal up until launch, but then the reviews hit, and I kinda lost all interest. So, I wanted to right that wrong and play the follow-up to one of my favourite childhood games. And do you remember a couple of years into the PS3's life cycle? They changed the font to this. But prior to that, the PlayStation 3 <laughs> infamously had the Spider-Man font. Yeah, look at the S. That's a Spider-Man S. Now maybe I'm the only person on planet Earth, but I find this box utterly hilarious. Yeah, so instead of embracing the open world, we start off in a closed-off indoor area fighting the most thrilling of Spidey villains, this guy, and his patient tutorial henchmen. It's definitely not the most exciting way to start the game, and it becomes clear pretty early on that this is a janky old thing. When disarming bombs, your webs just kind of float. You can also keep beating on enemies even when they're unconscious, until they're probably not alive anymore. You can swing them infinitely too. They're absolutely not okay. And you've probably seen those hilarious failed Spider-Man QuickTime events. They're from this game. And if you fail them, he sort of just forgets how to be Spider-Man and just flops down and dies. Ooh. Weirdly, the PlayStation 3 version's missing a few effects, uh, like some explosions, for instance. So on other platforms, like this scene plays out like this. Help! Please! Someone! I'm going to die! But on PlayStation 3... I mean, it didn't sound good, but she seems fine. So this whole section, a little slow, but that's okay because we can finally get out into the world and start swinging. Do you remember how Insomniac Spider-Man seamlessly goes from cutscene to throwing you into swinging? Yeah, that was cool. Spider-Man 2 also starts off outside, but there's a little tutorial area, but you're swinging in no time. For whatever reason, they wanted to start off this movie tie-in with a villain who is not in the movie and does not even exist. This guy, this guy is no one. He's not from the comics. He's no one. But is the swinging actually any good? Well, yeah, kinda. I mean, it works a lot like Spider-Man 2. Webs actually connect to buildings in the direction you point the stick, and if there's nothing nearby, your webs just miss. You can speed up your swing with the left trigger, giving you some momentum, and I really like some of the added flair. If Spidey's swinging and he touches the floor, instead of coming to a dead stop like in Spider-Man 2 and Insomniac Spider-Man, he stays on the web and he runs across the floor. That's really cool. But in general, it is a lot more automatic than Spider-Man 2. In that game, you had to manually let go of webs with the A button. It felt a lot more involved. You're not just going through the motions of pulling the trigger and letting go and pulling it again. It's like you're actually detaching something. 
It takes some time to master. In my early footage revisiting Spidey 2, I'm just floundering around, but by the end, I'm swinging pretty naturally. Spider-Man 3 doesn't have a skill barrier for swinging, really. Now, it's still a lot of fun to soar through the city, but there's a certain bit of mindlessness to it now. Although it is cool when you can really feel your webs connecting, like swinging under the Queensboro Bridge. This rocks! I also really like the more open indoor areas. Zipping over the water in the sewers feels good, and so does swinging over trains in the subway. I guess my biggest problem is how forgiving swinging is now, and how exploitable it is too. In Spider-Man 2, when you press jump in the air, you just do a little skill trick. It's the same with the Insomniac games. But here in Spider-Man 3, they've given him a double jump. And you know, did a character all about aerial movement need that? And where it becomes exploitable is your double jump resets every time you do a web zip. This moves also in the Insomniac games, just without the double jump. You basically pull yourself forward rather than swinging. The move is good, it's just busted. So let's take Central Park for instance. It's meant to be really close quarters swinging, where you can only rely on ground level trees. But if you do a web zip, it doesn't really matter how high up you are. Look, I can still pull myself forward even though I'm not at the ground level. And if I endlessly jump and do it again, I can just kind of float over the entire park. Yeah, this is balked. But even if it's a step back from the last game, swinging as Spider-Man is still just inherently fun. I mean, it does sometimes run at 15 frames per second sometimes, which must be some kind of <laughs> Spidey Sense thing. But if you were a kid who played this game growing up, I think you probably still had a good time just playing around in the city. Very little's changed with Spider-Man swinging today. Treyarch nailed it in the 2000s. Insomniac's just given it more visual care and detail. There's even segments where you disarm bombs, and that works in a very similar way to the science experiments from Insomniac Spider-Man. So you can blame this game for those. This is the true pioneer. Clearly schedules for licensed games are tight, and there's somehow like four versions of Spider-Man 3, and I don't mean four versions of the same game, four completely different games. This one's the HD version on 360, PlayStation 3, and PC, but there's also the PlayStation 2, Wii, and PSP version, and that's a completely separate 3D game with its own levels, and own story, and own open world. And then there's the GBA and DS games, and that's not describing one game, that's describing two games. GBA, DS, not the same thing. They were all handled by separate studios, but that's a lot of games to make in such a short time, especially to meet a movie deadline. And consider Treyarch were making Call of Duty at the time, and their last Spider-Man game wasn't three years ago with Spider-Man 2, but two years ago with Ultimate Spider-Man. So how does Spider-Man 3 meet its deadline? By barely being Spider-Man 3. Here are the actual parts adapted from the movie. There's the fight with Harry as he becomes the new Goblin. There's Spider-Man getting the symbiote suit. There's the fight with Sandman in the subway. And then there's the ending. Yeah, that's it. Four scenes, and one of them's a cutscene, so three parts of the actual movie are playable. Do you remember in the movie where Peter got so swept up in being Spider-Man that it ruined his relationship with Mary Jane? Yeah, that's adapted as this. This is so fun! And they've got a bunch of the actual actors in this. Previous games could get Toby and maybe the main villain, but this time James Franco is Harry, Topher Grace is Eddie, Thomas Church is still Sandman, and most importantly, J.K. Simmons is J. Jonah Jameson. Where's a photographer when I need one? Stay put! But oh my god, what is with these animations? What is this? Why does everyone look like Gmod? His hands go up every time he says giant lizards! Why? Get me giant lizards or you're fired! And you can tell Toby does not want to be here, and I can't blame him. Here's some of the dialogue they gave Toby Maguire. Guess the Apocalypse Gang has a max IQ test to join. Hey, didn't your parents ever teach you not to cry wolf? All the writing is bizarre. There's this one scene where Eddie's trying to get a picture framing Spider-Man, so he hires an overweight guy to dress up as him, stealing money, but then Peter comes in, breaks the camera, punches Eddie in the face, and Eddie says, Oh, you think you're smart, buddy? Well, think again. I hit a bunch of cameras around here, and now I have an even better shot than I was planning. You punching me in the jaw and taking my camera. So thanks. I can handle things! I'm smart! Eddie, what the hell are you talking about? No, no you didn't. No one, no one would have planned that. But then he runs off and leaves his cameras, and there's a timer for some reason. I don't know why there's a timer, but you just kind of go around and leisurely pick up the cameras. I don't think I'm smart enough to get this. And going back to Mary Jane a moment, there's literally no development with her for most of the game. There's like four missions where you swing around and she just loves it, but once Peter gets the black suit, suddenly he becomes unhinged. And despite there being no tension or development between them, 
This scene happens. And keep into account, you're not missing any context. This scene begins in a quiet restaurant with no one talking. You've hardly said three words all night. Is everything all right? I figured you were talking enough for both of us. Peter, what's gotten into you lately? Nothing that's stopping your gums from flapping wouldn't solve. This is very funny. Most of the game, though, has nothing to do with Spider-Man 3. There's five missions for the lizard, and you know what? That's kind of cool. Dr. Connors was fully established in the movies, but never got around to becoming the lizard. Wait, hold the phone. Did Dr. Connors ever give Peter a sample of the symbiote back in the movie? Does he still have it? Is he gonna become Lizard Venom? Sony, please leave a comment. So Lizard's cool, but unlike Spider-Man 2 which pulls from actual villains, they made most of these guys up. There's the Arsenic Candy Gang, the Mad Bombers, Dragon Tail, there's at least Scorpion as well, you know, he's real, and you work alongside DeWolf, who I think is meant to be Jean DeWolf, but they're spelt differently, so maybe Trialk made her up too. I don't know. And not to pick on this guy again, but he's the most Unreal Engine 3 guy I've seen in my life, and this game doesn't even run on Unreal Engine 3. If you're gonna steer away from the plot of the movie, it would have at least been cool to see Toby Spider-Man face off against a bunch of iconic villains, but these guys are so lame! Thankfully though, these all culminate in the Kingpin, who's bringing all these gangs together. This is really more of a Kingpin game, with like three missions from Spider-Man 3 scattered in somewhere. When Kingpin's introduced, he has a very important phone call. Mm -hmm. Wilson Fisk? What's the kingpin of crime doing here? Don't interrupt him. It's not a bad depiction, but they barely give him any screen time to do anything. You just do the exact same fight in three different rooms. And you know, the Spider-Man 2 game did this as well for the most part. That game had a bunch of different characters like Black Cat and Mysterio, but it also embraced the movie's DNA a little more. There's nothing in here as iconic as the train scene in Spider-Man 2, apart from this scene where you stop a train like in Spider-Man 2. But when it does actually embrace the movie, it's not great. The Peter vs. New Goblin fight starts off with some really long quick time events. I mean, look at this! Look how long this is! Brandon, speed up the footage! This goes on forever. Eventually, you get to fight him freely, and I think you're meant to do this in the air, but I just went down to the ground as a fully exposed Peter and get Harry locked in a punching combo while all the citizens walk by unfazed. He's clearly Spider-Man. They don't care. Combat's another area where things function. It's nowhere near as snappy as the previous game, and mostly feels very loose. But the big difference is instead of a Spidey Sense dodge, which is pretty much the same as the Batman Arkham Asylum counter, but five years before Arkham Asylum, Peter now dodges by slowing down time with the Spidey Sense. As long as this gauge has time to stay in slow-mo, you'll dodge every attack automatically. It's a little bit lame. Sometimes attacks can't be dodged, so if you see this light, you better run. Run away! But you know what? Speaking of Arkham Asylum, Spider-Man 3 actually has... Detective Vision, two years before Arkham Asylum. What did this game even do? Beyond being good. See me after class, Batman. Everyone give credit to Spider-Man 3 from here on. Batman's just a faker. You get the black suit around three quarters into the game and it's only really here for a handful of missions. So despite being key to Spider-Man 3, it's barely here. The black suit basically gives you this special meter that sends Peter into a fury mode, making him far more powerful. It's almost like all the bosses were designed with this mechanic in mind, but for most of the bosses, you don't have the black suit, so they just gave them a bunch of health. Like, way too much health. Combat in general, uh, isn't good. Spider-Man 2 and 3 both have these car chases where you jump on the roof and then punch the car or punch the people inside the car, and look how fast it is in Spider-Man 2. Can you guess what Spider-Man 3 is like? Did you guess faster? You can go and join Batman in the corner. It's like this. But why is it like this? They had it right the first time! And god, let's go back to the boss battles. Yeah, they all have a stupid amount of health and barely any strategy. I usually just hold down the Spidey Sense when I can and I guess just punch them until they die. There's a couple of different strategies, like this one where you stand on these grinders and it tells you what button to press way before you need to press that button, and then that's it really. At one point, Rhino stopped wanting to fight me, and to be honest, I get it. <laughs> one fight was so slow and tedious, so what I did was I stood on top of this building and just kind of lured them all out one by one. Most just ran into the wall, and they love doing that. This thug loves walls! 
Did you know Spider-Man 3 isn't a polished game? One time I just tried swinging in an indoor mission and accidentally took the camera anywhere I want to try and find secrets and new discoveries in some of my favorite games. Wow, these guys spawn from here? I love too how when you finish a mission, Spider-Man just freezes in whatever pose he was in last. I don't think he's okay. This actually happened to me during a cutscene once. It's meant to play out like this with Scorpion shooting a bunch of cars and throwing them at you, but instead... <laughs> Uh, Peter probably died in an explosion. And look, Resident Evil 4 didn't invent quicktime events. We had them way before in games like Shenmue, but I'm just saying it popularized them two years before this, and I'm just saying... Look, I I'm just saying... When it's nighttime, the world loses all color, which is a reference to Spider-Man you are, maybe. It's such a weird game visually. This is running on the next generation of consoles, and it does not look better than Spider-Man 2. NPCs a few meters from you run at like half the frame rate, and NPCs a few meters more than that are cardboard cutouts. 2 doesn't do this, and in that game New York's a pretty vibrant city, but now it's just grey and dingy. I think the best way to describe how this game looks is it's like movies in previs. Before spending a bunch of money on effects, many movies, especially Marvel movies, get these very cheap visualizations of how it's meant to look. That's the Spider-Man 3 game. The ending's the part that sticks to the movie closest, and there's some good. They gave Venom a completely different voice effect, and I like it. Oh, <laughs> let's watch your temper here. There's children present. I don't know what the sassy walking is, but you know what? I like that too. Weirdly though, Venom has kidnapped Sandman's daughter to make him fight Spider-Man, which was never in the movie. And Sandman already doesn't like Spider-Man from the fight that happened earlier in the game, but... Okay. There's a few phases to the final fight. In the first one, you just punch a stack of pipes to make a loud noise that stuns Venom, giving you time to be on him. Do that a bunch. A quarter of the way through, though, Harry comes in, and we actually get to play as him. With six axis controls. Yay! Now, while Peter's fighting Venom, Harry fights Sandman. And I found he can't actually hit you if you stick at the top of the screen and cycle round and just spam bombs. Takes a while, but it works. Then back to doing the same thing with Peter again. And eventually, it all ends in a quick time event. The results for messing up and succeeding are both brutal. If you mess up at the start, then Venom just crushes you to death. But if you mess up right at the end... Yeah, Spider-Man just got flipping impaled. They're pretending it didn't happen by spawning him back up here, but we all saw it. He got flipping impaled! If you succeed though, then Venom gets flipping impaled, which again, does not happen in the movie. What's meant to happen is Peter separates Eddie from the symbiote, but Eddie wants it so badly that he dives into an explosion, killing both the symbiote and Eddie. But here, no. Peter just flipping pushes him onto a spike and kills him. So Sandman's reunited with his daughter. Spider-Man and MJ flicker as they cuddle and clip through each other, and Peter gives us a little monologue talking about losing someone, which I think is meant to be Harry because he dies in the movie, but he never actually died here, Venom just hits him off screen and no one reacts. Crocom punch! All in all, a gripping tale. But you know, all the failings here make me appreciate Spider-Man 2 more, because for a licensed game, this isn't abnormal. It's a movie tie-in, they're almost always rushed, and of course you wouldn't have all the details of the film down, so doing your own thing makes a lot of sense. Again, if I played this as a kid, I think I still would have liked it. Swinging around as Spider-Man carries so much of this game, and for all we know, some of the changes to the story here could have come from an earlier draft of the movie. That's kind of fascinating to think about. Like the fight with Kraven the Hunter where he's meant to be invisible but I kept punching him and Peter kept talking as if I couldn't see him. That was probably from the movie before getting cut. So much for your camouflage. You are formidable, Spider. But you cannot strike what you cannot see. Come on out and fight! So I guess this all comes down to, did I enjoy Spider-Man 3 the game? And you know, on some level, yeah. It's clearly not polished, and in many areas it's just clearly not fun. But I still had fun just swinging around as Spider-Man, and I legitimately laughed along with how silly the animations and the writing was. So while this is definitely not a great game, it wasn't a complete waste of time. And if you're someone who grew up playing this game, I can see how you might be nostalgic for it. Even if there are many shortcomings, and in my opinion, it's nowhere near as good as Spider-Man 2. But again, the font is hilarious. <laughs>
It's the same three. Uh, you need to go up.